And we are live. It is Freedom Friday, and you are still not free. But after this hour, hopefully you will have some information that helps you be the freest that you can possibly be. We're missing the key element of the Freedom Friday show today, which is Sharif al Maki, my brother, my ace, my partner in crime when it comes to this particular show. He has a family um, uh, family situation that he is tending to that I don't feel free to tell everybody about. But I would just say to keep uh, Sharif in your thoughts and in your prayers as you move about the day today. And to uh, just know that we are always there for our brothers in, and our sisters in times of need, uh, whatever those times of need be. Right now, today, we have uh, Dr. Kelly Seaton, who is a longtime uh, collaborator with Sharif. Uh, Dr. Seaton is the, uh, now see, this is where we're going to get in trouble. I'm about to say the chief learning officer or the chief growth officer. What is it? The chief learning? Chief learning officer. You're absolutely okay. correct. Yes. Good. All right. See, I'm, I'm, I'm already starting the day out with getting some names right, which is, is hard for me, but the chief learning officer for the Center for Black Educator Development. And since this is Freedom Friday, and since we care about education and the teaching of the 8 million Black children in the United States, uh, Dr. Seaton has what we really need on the show is some insight into the mindset of the person who steps up and says, I want to educate Black children, be that a teacher or a principal or someone who wants to start a school, um, mindset matters. It matters what they think, what they know. Um, so good morning, Dr. Seaton. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. So I just want to talk a little bit like what our setup should be. I gave a little bit of a setup there, but um, if you're watching this and, and you know, you're wondering, OK, we know that mindset matters. That's not new to us. It's not news. Let's just start with some basics in terms of the situation and scenario. And then we can ask you a little bit more um, to delve in on the specifics of mindset and, and content and what people need to know to, to be effective as teachers of black children. But just to set the record straight at the beginning, we just numbers help. We have 8 million black uh, uh, children in the United States walking into schools every day that never were made for them, designed for them, and aren't really set up right now to help them reach, reach their highest potential. Okay, so that's the basis. 80% of the workforce is white, um, mostly women with some white men. Um, black male educators are less than, help me get this right, is it 4% or 2% nationally? 2%. Uh, it's less than 2% black male educators. So before 1954, almost exclusively the black child was walking into the care of a, a seasoned trained veteran black educator every morning, every day. After 1954 and after Brown, that slowly eroded. Um, the South lost 90% of its black principals who were either fired or demoted when black schools closed and when white uh, black students were shipped off to white schools. So within the period of a decade or two after 1954, the average black child was taken out of the care, the daily care of a veteran black educator who had spent years figuring out pedagogical um, uh, processes and procedures for helping black children learn in a hostile country in a hostile economy and handed over to a group of people that had that exact same expertise for white children, but not only didn't have that expertise for black children, also didn't have the love or the commitment mm -hmm. or the dedication to specifically being about black children. Mm -hmm. That to me is the setup. That's the background. That that to me tells me a little bit of my story of, of of my analysis of how we got to where we are today, where we're now having to rebuild black educational capital that was lost years ago. And boy, is an uphill battle. And you're talking about two percent black male teachers, and I want to say it's only four percent black teachers. Period. But it, it mm -hmm. I don't know if that's exact, but it's not a lot. Boy, do we have an uphill battle. So, Dr. Seaton, where I would want to start with you just is uh, um, on something that seems pretty obvious by those numbers is we're not going to get to 
1954 anytime soon, where we have the majority of black children in the care of a black educator every day. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the work that you think can be done with the teachers that they have now, the white teachers mm -hmm. uh, today? Yeah, I am. Um, so first, I just want to say, you know, even hearing uh, the numbers you shared, um, even though I've heard them and I've read about them and I've thought about them, it's still very sobering. Um, just to think about what's happening with black children, uh, Latinx children, children of color. Um, I, I think the, the biggest opportunity we have um, is the examination, examination of self. And I, I think that's also the scariest you know, place to do the work because a lot of the conversation is around the other, right? It's around um, let's change that person out there. Or, you know, the, uh, I, I hear, <laughs> I've heard white people say, well, yeah, there are racist people out there. Right. But I, I've often not heard white leaders or white teachers say, huh, to what degree, right. Am I embodying, um, racist practices to what degree am I embodying classes? And I say to what degree, cause I don't think it's a binary, right. I do think that like, there is this continuum of, um, extreme, right, versus not at all, but most of us probably fall somewhere between the like, on a scale of one to five, probably between a two and a five, versus like, I never do this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think this this idea of mindset is huge. And I think there's like, you know, there are opportunities to, to have other folks coaches around mindset, but I really think like, when you think about therapeutic work, right? A therapist can give you strategies, but the real work is what you do when you leave the conversation, right? The real mm -hmm. work is having you internalize the, the degree to which you are playing a role in your own demise or your own like co-creating the existence that you're saying you don't want. And to what degree you're willing to shift your own habits and practices until your, your mind changes or, right? Because there's another way, you can work on your mind until your practices change, right? But um, I think the biggest work is with the individual. And so then that puts the onus of responsibility um, on leaders. Like, like, I think, you know, I, I think a lot about coaching, coaching, coaching. And if we look at what's happening um, commonly, there's discussion on like teacher coaching, teacher coaching. And we've seen like an explosion over the last, I don't know how many years of very um, technical shifts a teacher can make to change outcomes in the classroom. We're not seeing, or at least in my experience, at a scale, at, at a at scale, we're not seeing the same focus on leaders, and we're definitely not talking about how do we coach leaders' mindset. Right, every principal should have a coach to coach that personal mindset because the leader of the school is the one who supports the teacher, supposedly, right, um, and holds the teacher accountable. So then that teacher can then best support the child and the family. Um, so I'll pause there because I want to be sure I'm answering your question. Um, but yeah, I do think it starts with that self-reflection. Um, but I also think like our, our leaders, our, our leaders need some support um, and not as a critique, but as a like, coaching is not a negative thing, right? Thinking mm -hmm. about mindset is not something's wrong with you. It says like, let's look at the outcomes. We're not totally happy with them if we're just to like being honest with ourselves. So let's get ourselves out of the way and get the help we need to be better. When you say that we have to be careful that we're not co-creating parts of the problem, mm -hmm. do you mean that writ large, like all of us, like parents and community members and educators, that we all are doing our, our part? Are you meaning specifically about school leaders and, and educators having to self-interrogate whether or not they're part of the problem? Yeah, so I, I do think every individual that touches the life of a child has an opportunity to reflect. My position um, as a chief learning officer is with the educator, right? Like my work is with like, what can we do um, as a system? And the system is made of, of individuals. And I, 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 I hesitate to, to talk a lot about what the family should do. Uh, and not to say that parents don't have a huge role because they do. And like I honor parents, they are the first child's teacher, the first child's model. But I hear a lot of conversation around like the problem with the family, right? And the inherent mm -hmm. element with the dad and the mom and like they're poor and they're, and I'm like, nah, like, no, we signed up to do this work to serve children and families. So let's first spend the most time examining ourselves and holding one another accountable, right? And sure, we partner with the family, but I think our relationship with family should be listening and learning. And if they ask for our advice, right, we offer it graciously, 
But a lot of the conversation, particularly in lower income communities and black communities, is how the family should change and what's wrong with the family. And there's just not a lot looking inward. Um, and I would say particularly with, with leaders, I think leaders model for their schools and what you see in a school, you will likely see in a leader. What you see in a school system, you will likely see with the superintendent. What you see in a country, you will likely see in the president, right? And so um, I think the leadership, uh, that's this is a huge opportunity that we have right now. Well, I think um, that one is so tough for me just in that um, I wish that educators and people within the classroom and schools would spend all of their time thinking about what you're saying right now, like is what is my part in working in a system and perpetuating a system that is broken and creates unequal results and um, and has fixable problems that we can fix before we start blaming families and communities and culture and poverty and things outside of ourselves. It's mm -hmm. not to say that those things don't matter. It's just to say that until you get your entire house cleaned up, the way that you prepare, you recruit teachers, you prepare them, you you monitor them, you support them, you evaluate them, and if necessary, you help them get out of the classroom, um, the classrooms where kids need the best. When you're not the best, mm -hmm. all of those things are still a problem. So until those are fixed, you really can't fix your lips to talk about anything having to do with the family's condition because. Mm -hmm your bedroom is messed up. So why would you go, you know, that I've said before, that's like the cousin who comes over your house and says, your house show is messy. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, it's your most trifling cousin mm -hmm. out of all of them. And mm -hmm. you're like, well, wait a second, wait a second. You don't get to come over here and do that until mm -hmm. your house is clean. At the same time though, this is where it becomes tricky for me is um, families, us, people who have children on the outside, realize that they're not going to clean that up anytime soon. We don't, we have no reason to trust that that's being cleaned up anytime mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then that does put a lot of the onus on us to save our kids. It's hard for me to balance those two realities, like, yeah. you know, to, to make sure that everybody's doing their part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, um, so I think about some of the families, like I think about a, a family that I'm like, you know, from my neighborhood when I was a principal that they they were, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy, right? Um, a number of families are struggling with, you know, and I'm not saying all, this is not all black families. This is not all families who are in urban communities at all, right? Mm -hmm. But I know a number of families who the parent may have had, um, uh, don't have an education, but beyond eighth grade, like I know specific families, like they want the best for their children they will like, you know, do what the school is asking. Right. Um, but they're not able to help them with geometry. They're not there. We had parents who were just so happy that their children were safe. Right. They just were safe that they weren't thinking about the SAT because maybe they didn't go to college. Right. Um, and so then that does put, a, a, I think, a more significant onus of responsibility on the school to to navigate that parent partnership differently than a parent who does know about the SAT, who can hire the extra tutor, who can help the child with geometry, who does know how to write a thesis statement, right? And so, but that that requires schools, I think, to, um, and I'm just going to say it, to not take advantage. I think there are times when institutions know, oh, this individual doesn't know any better. Like I've seen mm -hmm. institutions where as soon as the parent gets a lawyer, all of a sudden the school is operating totally differently. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's so. So why did that parent who got the lawyer that they get a different experience than the one who maybe doesn't have the money to get a lawyer, maybe doesn't think about getting a lawyer right? And so it doesn't mean so. It's right only right when the parent is going to hold us extremely accountable. It's like some of it is like we we know to do better. Like a lot of this is we we know what we're doing is not the best for families, but in, in many instances we can get away with it. Um, and when I say we. I'm saying we, right? Institutions, systems, folks who are um, serving in these uh, larger entities. So I'm not saying that a parent doesn't have responsibility. I actually think that parents have way more power, way more power than they think. Um, and then if parents decided to walk into these networks and districts in mass and demand change, I believe change will come much, much faster. I also recognize that when I'm talking to certain, like certain families, they're just trying to navigate some very complicated things in their own lives. And so like, their child's SAT becomes like less of a priority. Um, yeah. Um, what do you think some of those demands should be? 
like if we did have parents that were coming to the system and making demands of the system as a collective and together, what do you yeah. think some of the specific demands they should make to make sure that kids are getting the instruction that they need and the teachers that they need? Yeah, I, I think uh, one thing that I've found to be, that I've learned to be one of the most culturally responsive ways to engage with parents is shared decision-making. Um, and so it, as simple as who are we hiring to be the school principal, right? Like, who are we hiring to be the teacher? Now, of course, there are certain considerations, like is the person certified versus not certified? There's certain things schools have to consider. But what I find often is that the parents, um, the parents' perspective on hiring is not even, <laughs> not even thought of in the realm of school, like school hires, like at all. It's not even a, it's like, what? Why would a parent tell mm -hmm. us who should hire as a teacher? And I'm like, why would they not? <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the teachers with their child, like hours and hours and hours, why wouldn't the parent be able to weigh in on who's going to be like the moral example for eight hours a day? But there, but a lot of districts think, no, your, your, opinion, your opinion doesn't matter unless you have a bunch of money or unless you speak a certain way, or unless you communicate in a certain way, which is absolutely not right. Like that is just, so I think one one very specific thing is around hiring. Um, and I think just the philosoph like philosophically around shared decision-making. So even like, how do we use money? Like, do we talk to parents about, hey, we have this money, here are the issues we're having in our school. Like, let's talk about like, what do you all think is the best way to get to such and such and such? And of course, being clear about how we're going to make the decision, who makes the decision, like what's the process to get to the, like what we're actually going to do next. But I don't even think we think about, huh, let's ask our parents. And we have PTAs that sell pretzels and sell popcorn and like do the dances. Mm, but that's not really, like, that's not really holding power. Mm -hmm. Right um, in a school, and so when we start saying you're going to help us figure out how we're going to spend this money, that you're really saying I respect your voice, right? If we're saying you're going to determine, help us determine who's going to be the principal, because I really want this white guy who lives in my neighborhood, because we, you know, we do stuff together. But really, he's not the best one for the children. But I'm more comfortable with him. And you all are saying no, we want this person because they represent this, this, and this. And when we start deferring to what parents are saying, even more than like our own positional authority. I think that that is a, a thing that I think parents can ask for. And I think that's something that's, that networks and districts can actually do. I, I, I do believe that because I've seen it done. When it comes to that type of uh, decision making, I noticed that when I was a school board member and every year since, this is something that I pay attention to and I think is always going to be a problem or an issue or just a reality is that organized white parents and parents with of means and influence do have that type of power over the schools that they, they work in their school board, Absolutely. their superintendents, but it gets more um, drilled down than just like money decisions and hiring decisions. They actually start making moves on the curriculum itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What programs get in and out of a building, yeah. right? And who's going to teach. What books you, the children should be reading? Mm -hmm. What books? Do you think that there is a specific? Should we be looking for the same type of power that they have, just as black people, or are the things that we would be fighting for in terms of curricular um, decisions and and all the, those things would be different than what those parents are fighting for? I actually think we should have more power, right? I think that, um, and I say that because uh, to racism. Even if we say we, we have the same power, right, as the white folk who have the money and the means, racism kind of undermines that immediately because, the, you know, we all, Beverly Tatum says we all breathe in the smog of racism, right? Mm -hmm. And so I actually think we have to lean even more in the direction of groups who are historically oppressed in this country and say like, no, you can have a little more leeway because the assumption is that you shouldn't. The assumption is that your voice shouldn't be heard. The assumption though of a rich or well-to-do and educated white person or other is that they kind of should have the voice, right? And so I just think that this, so the mindset, so this gets at mindset. It's like, what do we believe about the other? And so if we're more likely to believe that they don't have a seat at the table, they should probably have more seats at the table. They should probably have a closer seat at the table, right? So I, don't, I actually don't think it's the same. Um, I think in terms of equity, the folks who are historically more oppressed need more advantage. Like, I just think that is the way you really level the playing field. Now, how that plays out, I don't know. I think I think numerically, I would say if there are 10 votes, <laughs> um, 
instead of it being 50 50 right like the folks who are more oppressed they have 60 percent of the vote like i think just in numerically speaking that is a way to do it but i also think philosophically we've got to get at like equity is about making sure those that are oppressed that we, that they get more steps to to like even up with the folks who have the privilege and don't even know they have it mm. um so you have done a lot of thinking a lot of work a lot of research around the specifics that we need, the, the technical parts of teaching, the parts of how we coach teachers and what they should know and what they should learn. You're obviously working for an organization that is looking to develop the next wave of educators. Um, what I'd be interested in knowing is like in your own background, in your uh, research and studies yourself, as you look to history or as you look to those who came before you or you know, the as you construct your own idea about a culturally um, informed uh, educator in education. What were the touchstones for you? What are the things that you touched upon, the, the folks that you read about um, that left an impression where you thought to yourself, okay, see, the, the universe is aligning. I'm starting to understand what Black education is about. What were those touchstones? What were the things that you remember that stick out to you? So are you thinking, are you speaking of like research or just in general? I'd say both, like, you know, researchers or, you know, yeah. who were the prominent researchers that stuck out to you where you thought, oh, okay, yeah, this they're they're giving me what I need to know. Like, this mm -hmm. makes sense. Is it Gloria Lanson Billings? Do you go back yeah. before that? Is it Marva Collins? Is it, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who are the so ones that I, stick out for you? Yeah, so I, I'm very fortunate to have been able to attend Howard um, University. And I think that was probably the first, that was the first time when, uh, like, my own, thinking about blackness was just pushed and pulled in so many different ways. And um, I remember reading, and I, I just pulled up this quote from Carter G. Woodson. So Carter G. Woodson, and I love this quote, and it just has me thinking all like about mindset so much. So the quote is, if you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his action. When you determine what a man shall think, you do not have to concern yourself about what he will do. If you make a man, of course, man or woman, feel that he is inferior, you do not have to compel him to accept it, accept an inferior status, for he will seek it for himself. If you make a man think that he is justly an outcast, you do not have to order him to the back door. He will go without being told. And if there is no back door, his very nature will demand it. So that that quote to me, even though I didn't know it at the time, that was all about mindset, right? That's all about like, what do you believe? So Carter G. Woodson was talking about what you believe about yourself. Right. But what but also like embedded in that were these other I call them like prisms through which we think about mindset. So there's like what you believe about yourself. There's what you believe about other people, because if you believe something about yourself, it's relative to like other people. Then when we think about education, family relationships, but I'll stick with education. There's also what you believe about the environment in which you work. Then there's what you believe about the work itself. So so an educator can say. Yeah, I can I can lead in this and I can be a leader. I can be a principal. But then it's like, can I be a principal in this environment? Can I be a principal trying to get these outcomes with this group of children, with this group of teachers? So Carter G. Woodson, I think, really, he's probably the father of mindset and nobody gives him credit, um, but I'll give him some credit. Um, so I would say like that sparked my my thinking a long time ago. And it was part of my dissertation. Um and Agbu, so John Agbu um, has some, you know, theories, and, and I'm John Agbu's theories talked about acting white and acting black, right? And he positioned mm -hmm. in that way. And honestly, I used to believe, oh yeah, it is acting white, oh yeah, right? Because that was the language that existed, and I hadn't seen other language. And there was another writer didn't do as much work, and I can't remember the name. They started talking about the emissary status, this idea of high achievement of African-Americans is actually like kind of what we do, right? If we look historically at the ways we've been able to navigate. Um, and I was like, huh. So my dissertation looked at like this juxtaposition of acting white and acting black versus no, it's not about doing well or achieving achieving is the opposite of blackness. It's actually like a representation of blackness. Um, and then fast forward, uh, Gloria Lassen Billings, absolutely her work around cultural responsive pedagogy that work to me, and I think I read this was birthed out of Derek Bell's work. Um, and so Derek Bell exposed to him at Howard. That was the first time I read about um, critical race theory. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like there's a way to look at things through the 
through the prism of race, right? Just simply through, hmm, if you look at it this way, it has a totally, maybe not totally, but a very different meaning than if we look at it that way, right? And so then you have Gloria Latson Billings. So Gloria Latson Billings' work to me was, um, was sort of generalist in a way, right? We had these three, these three areas of achievement, cultural competence, critical consciousness. Then we fast forward to Duncan Andrade, who I think it and took, I don't know if he, I'm assuming he read her work, right? Duncan Andrade must have read her work, but he was the first person who I believe defined achievement. So Gloria Latson Billings referenced achievement and described it. I think he defined it. Like he has these like three or four bullets that it was like, wow, like critical interrogation of the word and the world, right? What? That's very specific. Um, he talks about uh, achievement. Like, yeah, he talks about like standardized test scores are important. We're not going to just say be able to critique the world, but then you can't read and write at a high level. I was like, yeah, that does mm -hmm. make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think he gave a very actionable um, definition for what it should, what, this culturally competent um, achievement outcome should look like. And so then there's uh, there's another author he introduced, and I can't think of his name, but he wrote a book on hope and healing. And so that text starts to speak of this idea of how do we incorporate healing practices into like what we're calling cultural competence. And so I actually don't like trauma-informed. When I hear people say like trauma-informed, trauma-informed, I get the, ter the term, but to me what it says is, I am the educator and I am doing something to help you because something happened to you or something is wrong with you. What mm. it doesn't acknowledge is I'm hurting you too. I'm the oppressor too. It doesn't acknowledge like I need some healing as well. And so I actually don't know if I love, I don't, I don't love trauma informed practice. I get what trauma is. I think it's a, it's a helpful term, but I think the way we use it in education is very deficit based and it totally ignores um, how we can be, a relative oppressor. When I say relative, even as a black woman with a black woman, I can be an oppressor, right? Mm -hmm. Like not to say I can be, um, I am a white American, but I can still oppress my brother and my sister. And I just think that some of the terms we use don't acknowledge that. So I would say definitely um, Carter G. Woodson kicked off mindset, Derek Bell and his work around um, critical race theory, like everybody should read his stuff, like Faces at the Bottom of the Well. He's just the, the master. I think Gloria Latson Billings, her article gives like a very clear overview I will say I have not seen an article in my estimation that fully captures all of the questions we should ask. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's something that uh, Elmeki and I talk a lot about, like what, like we have six questions we ask. And I think like that is some of the work we're building out this year around what do, what do we believe is an organization that is really culture responsive um, pedagogy, but not just philosophically. It's like not just talking about, oh, in a world where or maybe this looks like, it's like, no, if you're a leader, you're supposed to be doing this, right? Mm -hmm. if you're a culture, and not even a binary, right? It's the high performing leader who is culturally competent, who is critically conscious, does these five things. Then there's the proficient one. You're not, you're not exemplary, but you're proficient. Then there's the one who like, you're, you're, you're developing. And so you're over mm -hmm. here. So I think there's a lot of room for us to get really clear about how it is actionable. And also say, if you're 20 years in the game, you should not look like a first year principal. You just shouldn't. Like that's mm -hmm. just, if you're a superintendent, you shouldn't be operating like a first year teacher, right? There's just a different level of responsibility. So those are the authors that I think are, that are influencing me. And I'm constantly <laughs> reading other folks stuff to figure out like, what are we missing? What are we missing? And then just talk talking to other people who are also thinking about it. Like I found like that's probably one of the best ways to push our thinking forward is to just talk about how does this work and then applying it to ourselves. Like how am I culturally competent or not within this context versus this one? And then thinking about, so then what does that mean when I'm coaching someone, right? And I'm trying to help them grow in the same area. So I said a whole bunch. So I'm going to stop. <laughs> oh, this is this is great. Just in that listening to you with all those authors, I thought to myself, like, if you pull all those together and say, OK, these are the this is we've talked in the show before about a black canon, what should be mm -hmm. the authors that you can't escape. You have to actually read if you yeah. want to, like, come to the forefront of teaching black children. Um, and I was just thinking to myself, there are going to be so many people who are not going to line up what you just lined up. 
that's not going to be the group that they line up. You know, they, they might line up Dewey and, mm. you know, and Horace Mann and, and, you know, come, you know, Piaget or whatever, right. And, oh, yeah, and yeah. You, you know, arrive at some totally different point because they mm -hmm. lined up a different set of authors and research. But the Carter Woodson thing to me is astounding what you just said. And I've never matched it with the mindset. I've matched a lot of his uh, work with, you know, the miseducation of the Negro being about other things, but the mindset of the individual, the way you just laid that out, spectacular. Um, the, it's so jarring to hear too, if you control a man's mind, yes. that if there is no back door, and Sharif has said this before too, if there's no back door, he'll create one. He'll create one. Damn, I mean, that was what, uh, I don't know how many years ago that was. Was that a hundred years ago that maybe he wrote that or more? Uh, um, and still today, you will find that situation, people still creating back doors uh, where the one doesn't exist. Help me with Ogbu. So you said um, um, Carter Wilson, and then you went to Ogbu. So Ogbu is the acting white thing. I've always been super suspicious of Ogbu mm -hmm. in, this, in this one way, because I've seen people take the acting white research and do all kinds of damage to us with it, saying that, you know, see, we don't we don't support excellence. As a matter of fact, we tear down those amongst us who are striving to be smart and to do good things in schools mm -hmm. and whatever. And I've never believed it, but it is research and it's out there. And and help me with Agbu. What's his contribution beyond the acting white uh, analysis? Well, he he's also created some um, ethnic, at least one ethnic identity model um, to understand like where we might fall and how we view ourselves. Um, I will say when, so I was exposed to him when I was doing my dissertation and there's been lots of other writers post him. Um, I also think an individual's worldview, right? Their experience um, either being indigenous to the United States or not. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I learned more about him and, and I could be misquoting it, but I don't think I am. I don't think he's African-American. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think there is a difference between having generations of your family, you know, having a having a history of slavery in your family versus moving here from someone else, both being of African descent, but potentially that impacts how you view blackness, right? Because you, your great, great, great grandparents weren't slaves. So when you read about a text and you're reading about slavery, it's the other, right, that was enslaved, not your, and you can still say it's horrendous, it's terrible, it's, it's you know, Satan, you can say all those things, right? But it still did not directly impact you. And so I think there's a, there's a, and I think I've heard folks say like post-traumatic slave syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like if you haven't experienced that in your genealogy, you will likely not see the impacts in your family because your family didn't experience that. And so your interpretation of it will likely be different. I will also say like my dissertation taught me that, so the the high, the high school students I work with in my study, they lived in um, Lafayette, Indiana, which is not, uh, you know, not an urban area. So there weren't a lot of black people. They were uh, often around, um, you know, white, white folks had very few black staff. So the way they defined their um, eth uh, ethnic identity and race was very different than students who lived in Indianapolis and Chicago, right? And so that also struck me. I was like, huh. So acting white and acting black, because I do hear even now, uh, folks that come from Baltimore and Philly, not all, right? I'm not saying mm -hmm, all, but I mm -hmm. do know a, a number of folks um, who still say, you sound white, <laughs> or you sound, <laughs> this is how you sound, because in their minds, that's just how they make sense of it. Now, once you start to interrogate what they really mean, the, I've heard folks say, well, that's not what I mean, but you know what I mean, right? And then I have other individuals who have like read a lot of like works about what it is to be black and what acting white really means in the history of that term, they have consciously decided that's not what it means. Like I'm not going to use that term because it's actually saying that I'm in, I'm saying I'm inferior. That's kind of what I'm saying. If I'm saying like mm -hmm. anything that is quote unquote better or higher achieving or what or, or whatever the words are is white and mm -hmm. anything that is like oppressed and like struggling is black. I think there's some folks who just consciously like said, that's not true and I'm not gonna use it. So I do think there are groups that still use the term. I think geography matters. I think um, the, the history of your family and the country matters. And so I don't, I used to subscribe to like, yeah, that's acting white, acting black. And now I don't, I get why people yeah. say it. I do get why they say it, but no. Like there's a, there's a serious, white. there's a, um, there's a serious nuance that I think is missing that's really important there. And you just hit on a couple of them. I think if you are in a mixed school, 
um, and you have white and black, and the whites in the school are seen as the ones that have a little more in life, mm -hmm. and you start uh, behaving in some ways that aligns you more with them in the classroom and elsewhere, you will get the charge of acting white um, by trying to be proper and blah, 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 whatever. If mm -hmm. you are in an all black school, that is a mixed school that has a mix of underperforming and jocks and mm -hmm. studious kids and the, the track athletes and the this and whatever, you're in a civil society of all blackness, you're going to have your, your, your studious kids and your burnouts and your, mm -hmm. your jocks and your, um, your mean girls, whatever. And none of it's gonna be associated with white because it's all associated with black because everybody's black. Because right? everybody's, like, so, everybody's black, right? So if you're in all black school, that acting white thing becomes less of a less of a thing. And then there's this other part of it that does drive me a little bit batty is I look at some black conservatives like um, John McWhorter and uh, Glenn Lowry and Candace Owens and Larry Elder. When they bring up the charge of acting white, I think they're talking about a personal pain that they actually were acting white in their lives and mm -hmm. they don't know it, right? And, and to be very honest with you, if you listen to them talk, they speak of black people as if they are white people, right? Mm -hmm. So so when I hear them make the charge of this acting, you know, we got to stop kids from, you know, thinking that doing well in life is acting white or whatnot. I'm thinking to myself, number one, you're alienated from your own culture. You mm -hmm. have not been in all black environments where there have been black smart people. You, know, you have never lived in a neighborhood where there was a black doctor and a black postal worker right, and a black right. unemployed person, right. right? So your experience is different than others and you probably were acting white because you're acting white right now. You sound white, right? <laughs> right now, actually what's mm -hmm. coming out your mouth mm -hmm. could be any white person in America talking about us. You're talking about your own people as if they are an other. Exactly. So, so that's the nuance for me is in, uh, in, in, in all black environment, there is no acting white because you're smart people and you're underperformers and you're employed and unemployed people are all in the same boat. They're all like married. You know. and, and, and they don't all love each other. I'm gonna say too, there is some bougie stuff that can happen or whatnot and some looking down the nose and all that. But I worked, I, I grew up in a, a working class black environment where there were no white people. There maybe was one or two people passing for white, mm -hmm. but there were no white, white people. And there was a range of, you know, achievers, like there yeah. was a range of achievement achievers and it was considered black. That person down the block who was really high achieving or whatnot and came from a black family that maybe had a barber and a teacher at the head of it or whatnot, were still black. Yeah, I, I really think it gets, when I think about when I was a principal, right? Or even adults who talk, who we have these conversations and are like social, but I'm talking about professional folks and our, you know, doors are closed on a Saturday, having our girlfriend conversations. Um, I think it is, it is really about how conscious are we. And so um, in schools where children are explicitly taught to interrogate these terms, right? And understand the history of the terms mm -hmm. and then start to examine their beliefs about mindset, your belief about the self, yourself, the belief about others, your sister right next to you, your teacher, your mom, the belief about your environment. Like, how do you think about living in Germantown? How do you think about living in West Philly? How do you think about living in Nice Town versus Chestnut Hill, right? So you think about your beliefs about the environment, your beliefs about the work, right? The work that you're doing. And even I would say the fifth construct I've been thinking about recently is the belief, your belief about faith. And it doesn't have to be God, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be Christianity mm -hmm. or Islam, but your belief about what is possible. I think when schools tr like really do some conscious work on themselves first as leaders, then as the teacher, then with the children through the curriculum. And it's, it's like throughout the work, I've seen young people just become more conscious. Like, yo, why am I saying this? Like, and then start to like hold one another accountable. Like, yo, remember we're not saying that, right? But I think some of it is we get in the habit of just doing what we do and not even thinking about it or examining it. And then until someone says, hold up, which is what education should do. It's just say, hey, come close. Let's look, mm -hmm. let's step back and look at like what, you know, the critical examination of the word and the world, like Duncan and Jody said, let's look at this. Is this what you really mean? Well, let me show you some examples of like folks who look like you and what they did. And it's like, oh snap, I didn't know that, right? And so I, I've seen it just elevate the language in an entire school, but it starts with how do the leaders think, right? And how are the leaders like talking about stuff with the adults 
What are those conversations like? And not just conversations, but in practice, when we say, hey, if you believe this, Carter Woodson said, if you believe this, this backdoor you just built for this family, let's tie that to a belief. Let's talk about this belief. Now, what's the thing you really need to do with this family? And we talk about that with children. It like I think that is a game changer. And then children will start to hold adults accountable. Like, like we'll say, hey, you didn't ask our opinion because now they know my voice matters. Or, hey, can I share what I think we should do? You didn't ask me. That's OK. But I still have something to say. Right. And I'm just like, wow, like what if every school was like that? Right. Like, yeah. You mentioned earlier that, you know, part of this is geographic and your dissertation was on um uh, you did research in a community that isn't necessarily the one we're always talking about, like the mm -hmm. urban, the hyper urban nice uh, community. Does this get a little complicated for you when you think about the fact that 50% of our kids aren't even in the urban centers anymore? They're in the suburbs and no one is really studying their experience for one. And two, we still have a lot of black people in rural areas that are not necessarily Chicago. Um, the idea that our kids are not a monolith. They're living in a range of experiences that range from rural to urban. Um, some places where the bottom has be, been deindustrialized and the bottom has fell out, Gary, Indiana, Chicago, um, Oakland, um, places where there used to be a booming black uh, middle class and working class group has mm -hmm. fell out, but they're not all there. They're now 50% are in these suburbs, yeah. for instance. Yeah. You know, I've only yeah. seen one good book on the 50 percent of black kids now that are living in what was once considered to be the land of milk and honey. If we could just get our kids out to the suburbs, for yeah. instance, well, 50 percent yeah. of them are there now. And what you just said to me scares me. If it does come down to the leadership, how's the leadership thinking about these things? We have now transferred 50 percent of our kids into a leadership that isn't even the urban leadership where you, you at least have people who are thinking about. Uh, cultural, I don't know what you want to call it, affirming, responsive. Mm -hmm. Help me with these terms too, Dr. Seaton. I know yeah. math is too many questions, but help me with this these terms. <laughs> uh, cultural uh, informed, cultural relevant, cul all of those things to me sound like words you use when you're not the same culture as the people that you're teaching in some ways, because it's like in, in China, you don't call Chinese food Chinese food, it's just food, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were <laughs> if you were the same culture of you don't have to be culturally informed or responsive or am I missing, am, you know, as a layperson, I'm messing up them terms. Well, first, I will say there are lots of terms out there. There is like culturally <laughs> responsive at pedagogy. There's culturally sustaining and affirming. Um, and I've Sharif and I have talked about this, about like, what are we going to call it as an organization? Like, what's our position? I think the. I think that all of us have space to be culturally responsive because what, in my estimation, like like what, what even, like you just said it, like we're not a, a monolithic group. So what, if you take a group of a hundred black people, are they exactly the same? No, right? And so how can we think about this person's experience and like my assumptions or biases about this person, how they may get in the way, right? I think that can happen with any, that can happen when everybody the same, this is the same religion, everybody's the same gender, everybody's the same income. And so I really think it's about, honestly, it's about just being a better human being. Like, I really think it's about like, how can I just be like, like work on myself and my stuff to get out of the way of like harming other folks and then also bringing restoration to other folks, right? Like I think that's sort of the, and through education, some of that restoration comes through like achievement, right? Like I can't say we're gonna restore, yes, I believe in you, but I'm not teaching you to read and I'm your first grade teacher. You know, you're not really, you know what I mean? So I do think like the term is helpful because even within the same group, we've hurt each other, right? Sometimes we hurt ourselves. Like think about the things that like some people just say to themselves over and over. I ain't never gonna do this. I'm never gonna do this. I'm never gonna, like that's like, you gotta bring about your own restoration about your own thinking about yourself. Never mind you the messages you're already getting about yourself to reinforce that, right? And so there's a way to be responsive even to ourselves on the way to like healing, which is like our fifth, our fifth um, professional learning question. Does that answer that question? It does. I feel like some for some of us, it's easier to talk in a negative than an affirmative. So for me, like if you were to ask me, Chris, what is culturally deforming 
um, education, yeah. what is culturally deformed instruction, I would be have an easier time of telling you what that is than yeah. what its opposite is. Because I do believe that we are sending a large number of children of color into classrooms where there is a massive disconnect between the 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 standard norm, cultural norm of the environment that they're in and the one that they are bringing from home. And mm -hmm. I don't think that children are stupid. I think children are smart and they discover that early. They discover, oh, wow, this ain't about me. This has never been about me. This is about that dude. This isn't yeah. about me um, because what I know about myself and my house, my home, my culture, where I'm coming from is totally different than all of this. And I'm yeah. being uh, integrated into this or I'm being accepted or tolerated into this, but it ain't actually, it's for this other kid. Uh, and I think that they are smart about that. They, they, yeah. they learn it before we think they do. Yeah. They catch the cues. Some of them catch it from TV and everywhere else. They figure out, oh, I'm not the superhero. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I see. Oh, I'm not the president. I'm not the person on money. I'm not the person who leads the newscast. We have entire uh, networks that have one person of color, black person, and whatever. If we don't think those don't send messages to kids early, and then they get in a classroom where everybody in authority is white in many cases, yeah. or the people who are black. I'm going to leave that one alone, but oh, yeah. the class issue um, because here's the thing. Let's, they are black. So let's not let's not leave it alone. Let's let's uh, interrogate that. Because I was thinking <laughs> the same. I was literally thinking the same thing. Um, I I was talking to El Mackey the other day around like what what has the worst impact? Not root let, not root cause. What has the worst impact on educational outcomes for black and brown children? Nepotism or racism? Right. And so because I've seen organizations where the relative becomes more important than the mission or the, the learning outcomes of the children to whom we have committed to serve, right? I've also seen organizations where the white colleague who lives in my neighborhood, who I really like and we're comfortable and we drive to work together, I'm going to promote that person when I know he's not the best for this school. The impact, you know, the impact is the root cause is different, right? Racism is systemic. And I'm not going to argue that because that is just what it is. But what, what I've seen in terms of like, sacrificing children it's it's all a sacrifice it's all like you know the relationship is more important than this child and so the damage the damage is similar and so sometimes i think what is worse is it worse to have like a black person who's like not choosing to serve the family and the child for their reason their friends or the white person who's like reinforcing racism but still hurt it. And I'm like, I wish we just didn't have to choose between either. Mm -hmm. um, I think both exist. I think the opportunity for change, I believe, and I could be wrong, might be easier when the issue is around the relationship in the way. Um, maybe. But long story long, I have thought a lot about that, like the, the impacts of those two things. Um, they're both just problems. They both hurt children. They both hurt families. They're both not fair. Both groups are getting paid to do a service they're not providing at the end of the day. Um, and that's just unjust. Hmm. Uh, do you think that black educators and educators of color do enough self-interrogating of even their class role within the oppression of the children that they are teaching and lording over? Do they do enough thinking about it as their um, own part in it? I, I, you know, I don't know if it's about I don't know if I can say, I don't know if I have an answer for that. I think in general, uh, reflection is not a common practice from what I've seen in education about the self. Now we might say, oh, did we get our achievement data, right? Oh, let's look at our attendance rate. But I don't know how often the common conversation is like, man, what do I believe about myself in the work and like who I'm working with and around these children? And like, am I going to be honest? And who am I having hold me accountable about what I believe? The beliefs really, and I think a lot of people don't touch mindset. A lot of mm -hmm. people talk about, you know, we had the growth mindset and I can't remember who wrote that, but, and I get the idea, like, yes, things can change. That, that goes back to like, Yes, that also yeah. goes back to the malleability of the brain, right? So that was already written before in another article, right? Around like your brain will grow and change as you push and pull. So that's like just how the body's made. And I think that's great, right? But what we don't do is figure out how do we operationalize that um, in the work and hold folks accountable and how do we coach 
that? Like, how do we coach folks around mindset and not just teachers with children? Because it's not just about like teacher, what do you believe about the child? It's like, what do you believe about yourself and leader? Like, I, we just don't talk enough about that. And I think that is the missing element because we have leadership frameworks. We have like be organized, build relationships, examine data, like communicate. Well, we have all these like like um, technical still skills, even around leadership. You Google it, you can find it. But try to find something on how to coach mindset in a leader. Yeah, and it's not there. there. You know, this is something putting a lot of what you said today into a blender for me and coming out the other end with a smoothie. (laughs) This is what I'm thinking. Um, So like this quote always comes back to me. I love it. Uh, Lerone Bennett uh, Jr. wrote Before the Mayflower, which I think is a book that everybody should have if you're going to teach in in black classrooms. Put down that 1619 and pick up Before the Mayflower because it's the book that gave you 1619. Mm. And this this is the scholar who inspired that sloppy 1619 project, whatever. Um, an educator in a system of oppression is either a revolutionary or an oppressor, right? Mm-hmm. So when I ask you the question of whether or not black and people of color in classrooms are doing enough to interrogate their own part in a system that is oppressing black children, it's a rhetorical question in some ways, because my answer t- to that question in some ways is I don't think not enough. There's a couple of um, ingredients to that that I would say makes make sense to me. Um, number one, the number of black people with a degree, a college degree, is an elite number of people in, mm-hmm. when you're thinking about black people. So if you are a teacher, you have to at least admit from the very beginning you're part of a small number of black people, right? Mm-hmm. You have a college degree. But mm-hmm. just by virtue of doing the job you have, you have to have a college degree. Yeah. And in many cases, you came through a system that worked for you in some kind of way because you were one of the ones who made it all the way through and got a college degree. And now you have a post where you're teaching other people who are not in the same lane that you were in that got you to where you're at. And in some ways, those educators start to sound like their white uh, colleagues more than they start to sound like what Lerone is calling for you to be here, revolutionary. They're not the ones who are making a lot of noise about their colleagues, they are not admitting that the colleague in the classroom next to them shouldn't even be in that classroom or whatever. When unions come out or whatnot, they're on the front lines with the red t-shirt like everybody else and they're not fighting for better teachers and better education. They're fighting for better jobs and better Mm -hmm. things for themselves. This is a critique that I'm making. I understand it's not a popular critique or whatnot, but when I talked about at the beginning of the show about 1954, the educators that we lost are vastly different than the ones that they were replaced with when I'm talking about black and of color educators. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about our uh, of color educators, it's not to cast dispersion on all of them. It's just to say they are not in the same league as the ones we lost that had t- uh, years and years and years of pedagogical training that they developed for themselves prior mm-hmm. to 1954. They're the ones that were replaced after we lost all of those that had had knowledge that the white institutions didn't have. And then the white institutions put out a whole new group, very small number of them. So your work at the center, I think, in some ways is hopeful in that it's repairing a breach. It's repairing something that has been lost. It's recreating something that has been lost. Again, not to you know, I know you're not gonna let me get away with talking about our existing black educators and oh, educators. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Right. Oh, yeah, you not, you not, I know you're not gonna let me get away with saying that, but I'm just going to say to you, there are many people who have read Gloria Lansing Billings and have not read it as a critique of the system, has have read it as a political rally cry for why we just need to put more money into the existing system and double down on it and not do any privatizing or do anything that um, gets us out of the system, existing system. And it's a real weird way to read her work, to like think that it supports the existing system. Yeah. Um, and And there are a lot of white teachers unions that love her work just as much as anybody and don't see it as a threat to their systems. So yeah. anyways, go ahead, go ahead. So let me just, let me just say this. I yeah. think the thing that, and that keeps me inspired the most um, in this work would be um, definitely seeing like black, going into a school and just seeing black children talk and think in ways that are like, wow, I didn't even talk like that. But I think the other thing would be these phenomenal black educators. like. I meet folks who just make me 
feel like I got to stand up a little bit taller. And so I, I think the number one thing we can do, and yes, I believe in the rally and the marching and the all of that. But my, my question will always go back to like, yes, while you're on the line, what did you do in your classroom? Like, right? Like, like what did you do with that parent leader? What was that coaching conversation like? When you led that meeting, how much did you prepare? Like, how much feedback did you get? Like, how many voices did you elevate? Because there, there, there is like the like, there are different ways to be um, uh, an advocate, I believe. And I do think that like, what is in our hand to do, to me, is the most important thing. And oftentimes it's what's right in front of us right now. So the best black educators I've seen, when you go in their classrooms, in their buildings, they are on it. And so they become a model for what can be done. And I think that, I think sometimes we miss that. And I don't, and I guess policy is important and talking to all these folks and raising money and fighting and marching, absolutely. But it's almost sometimes like the parent who was out there right? And then their children in the house don't have what they need. And so I do believe there is this huge opportunity to, yes, think about the, what we do out there, but what, what are you doing in the house? Like, what are you doing in your house? Because ultimately, that's the thing for which you're directly responsible. And I want to be able to send people to your school, to your classroom, to your whatever, so we can watch you and learn from you because we need more folks like that. And the people I've learned the most from are folks I've just sat in their classes or in their meetings and been like, or in a workshop and been like, how did you do that? And I mm-hmm. study that and like, I want to be like you. And so I, I've I, I know some great educators now. We may not have them in mass because they've been moved out. We also have a whole system right now. Black educators are are like swimming upstream, whereas prior to Brown, there were we were together. There were lots of us to reinforce us in our communities because we live together. So there are lots of other constructs too that make it harder to even f- fight the way we might have fought years ago. And but I I, I got to say, I know some fantastic. I mean, I've seen folks. Teach and, and I'm going to say this much. I do, too. I know I want to be clear about this. I know what's different. So first of all, let me say a couple of things about this one. Um, I think Vanessa Siddle Walker is my ace when it comes mm-hmm. to these things, because if you really look at what you just said, if you look at the cohort system that they had of the critical mm-hmm. mass of black educators, it produced more than its individuals. The whole of it cr- exactly. produced more than its individuals. They created assessment systems across state lines. They had such good communication systems with other black educators. They they had, um, in a time where it was really dangerous to travel, they had whole ass conferences of black mm-hmm. educators mm-hmm. in different states where whole carloads of ed- black educators were coming to meet with each other. There was critical mass and it created systems and pedagogical systems that weren't being disrupted by um, the white professionals. It, it actually, what I see, what I see now today is exactly what you you say. I do see a lot of uh, black teachers that are like black cops. They are no different than their white colleagues. So I'm mm-hmm. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to back off of that. I see enough <laughs> of them. I'm not going to back off that at all. They're just like black cops and black judges and other black fields. There are enough of them that are no no different than their colleagues in terms of their politics, their policies, and the way they see our people. That's mm-hmm. one group of people. What you just said, I absolutely see that too. There are black educators right now, to me, who are the ones who should be leading these discussions and should be studied and people should be going to them uh, and saying, what is it that you're doing in your classroom? And what I find in them oftentimes, you find hope and inspiration in them, which I do too. I also, they're my greatest source of cynicism because oftentimes they are marginalized or they are frustrated or yeah. they are two steps away from telling everybody that they can go to hell. Yeah. Like they are tired. They are not valued. Yeah. They're not being lifted up for what they can do um, in their in their districts that they're in. So I, I see them like you see them too. They are there. They are worthy of, of attention and support. And oftentimes they're not getting the attention and the support. And all around them are people doing the wrong thing yeah. oftentimes. And the way yeah. that I know that is, they're the ones who tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Half of yeah. what I say about teachers comes from other teachers. Yeah, you and, and <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I guess, and I know we're we're at time, so yes. I be respectful See, look you. at you, you on you on your educator thing. <laughs> I want to be respectful of, of you as an <laughs> here. Um, I I uh, 
I, so I think about two things, two things I, I continue to think about. And one thing I'm taking away even more so now is the work begins with us as individuals. And when I say that, I mean, even myself, like I have to constantly think about what do I believe? I don't feel like dealing with that. Well, you need to deal with it because your outcomes are not what you want. So deal with it. Right. So mindset matters, but also this new evolving idea. And I think it's one that our organization has talked about. So other organizations is how do we build cohorts? within these like oppressive environments so folks feel safe. Um, now, what I will say is when I've attempted that in other places, white folks are like, well, why y'all get to be together? But that goes back to leadership, right? If leadership says, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, y'all just get over it, this is the new norm. I do think we'll see oper more opportunities um, for folks to feel less I don't know, oppressed even in their own school systems. I think we'll see a higher synergy um, and energizing around the work with children. And I think folks will feel like they can sustain longer because mm -hmm. relationships do matter. Like relationships with people that are like-minded that can just listen and be like, girl, I know, or yes. And so what we're going to do together, I think that matters. And I think that's, a, that's an opportunity. It's a scary one because the more you create spaces for the oppressed, the more those folks will probably get stronger and then it requires something different of leadership, which is oftentimes what leadership does not want um, because it requires them to change. But I think that's an opportunity and it's one that we, we need to tap into. I just love that you can put things into perfect perspective um, <laughs> and make it real for me and for everybody else. Uh, I just think that that is like your gift. Every time I hear you speak or write or whatever, it's so clear and on the money and balanced and nuanced and not crazy. Um, which, you know, I, I think maybe you and I might balance each other out because I go <laughs> the other direction a lot. So um, I want people to know about this work that you're doing with the Center for Black Educator Development and the center itself. I have it up on the screen so that people can see it and and uh, hopefully go out and, um, and investigate it, uh, support it. Uh, hopefully through donations and through um, financial support, material support. But tell us more about the center um, and what the audience should know about the work that you are, you all are, are doing there. Yeah. Um, so we this year, our work is uh, really heavily focused on um, partners in ways that has shifted from last year. We started with really um, an explicit focus on teacher coaching. It evolved into leadership coaching and providing workshops. We now have partners um, in universities who are asking us to help them develop uh, more culturally responsive mentorship models in their teacher education programs. We're working with uh, an organization that has 21 different teacher prep programs, and they want us to um, coach mm. their coaches on how to be culturally responsive. We're working with a, a Midwestern school district uh, of 500 educators, and we're going to be doing workshops every single month with them on uh, culturally responsive uh, pedagogy, like examining bias, um, dealing with microaggressions. And so a lot of our work this year is building out relevant content uh, with our partners, delivering workshops. Um, and I will say like our thinking around the professional learning has grown from when we used to do workshops, it was around, did you experience the work? Was it a good experience? Did you learn something? We're now thinking more about a level four evaluation, which is, did you enjoy it? Did you learn something? Now level three is, did you translate it into practice? Mm -hmm. And then level four is, did, was that practice sustained to the degree that it has changed your outcomes? And so the, the training is really level one and two, what we believe is in order to help folks get to level three and four outcomes, that that is a partnership of either their leaders being coached to then support the work or our organization supporting them with coaching after we've um, delivered some training. And so our, our work is definitely shifting um, and we have some folks who are like, just super excited um, and we're you know working to build our capacity, build our content. And we're finding that as an example, one of our partners has a Native American population that's requiring us to even examine our own thinking even more so about mm -hmm. like this, this population that typically is invisible, right? Um, that like they're saying, no, nah, in our region, this is, we need to consider this. And so that's been like, oh, wow. Like it, looking at my own beliefs, right? Like, wow, why didn't I think about the Native American population? when we're looking at racial identity. Hmm. So yeah, we're, we're growing and learning and just really excited about the opportunities we have. And we, we are hopeful and optimistic that it is going to lead to further change for the sake of children, families, and communities, for sure. Mm. I love it. I love what you're doing. I appreciate you for coming today and jumping in. 
and helping us continue the like the stretch of Freedom Fridays that we've had where we have talked about issues that are straight up germane to educating black children. And uh, without Sharif here today, um, um, and he is in our thoughts and our prayers with his, his uh, situation that he's tending to at home, um, you actually brought it with all kinds of continuity, like just like mm -hmm. just everything that we have had, uh, logical, hopeful, uh, research-based, evidence-based thinking in a world where we are becoming fact-free and loud and aggressive with bullhorns in streets or whatnot, we will always need our educators to bring us back to what is the program, what is the outcome we're trying to achieve, what is our method of get, getting there, how will we know we got there, how do we assess our progress, we're not. This is the superpower I think Black educators could bring to the table to the entire Black movement. Yeah. Like the yeah. entire movement that we I need. Agree. So I you agree. are like worth your weight in gold <laughs> to us because we have so little of that like disciplined thinking. And I think that type of educated disciplined thinking is hope inducing because it do the world doesn't feel so mysterious if you right. have that, right? Like, Great. you know, things become more clear. So thank you for that. Thank you for your work. Um, thank you for the organization that you all are, are doing. I see y'all in the comments every week. You all bring it. Um, you have so much to add. Michelle Johnson said in this in this uh, uh, in this line of comments today that we need our own prep program. Mm -hmm. We had others that said we need to think beyond the bake sale when it comes to what you said earlier, Kelly, about our parents having power, real power in the decision making mm -hmm. in their schools. Um, I saw lots of people um, doing exactly what we need to do is sharing this and your information with other people. Like they're tagging other people into this. Networking oh. is amazing. Network <laughs> is is everything. It is what creates, it makes the world go round. Collective networking, sharing of power and, and information is what makes it all work. So thank you, Dr. Seaton. Appreciate thank you. you. Thank you. Um, thank you to the viewers, the watchers. This has been another Freedom Friday and you are still not free, but hopefully you are freer than you were than when we began this an hour ago. Um, appreciate you all for watching.